our special guest, Christian Perslow, who is former MD of Liverpool, Chelsea, and most recently chief exec at Aston Villa. I did ask for texts and tweets. We've got one from here from Lee in Stourbridge, who says, Guys, can you thank Christian for everything he did at Aston Villa? He played a huge role in bringing us out of the dark years under Chinese ownership. He is well thought of at Villa. There you go. That's nice, isn't it? Oh. Thanks for reading it. I thought you were going to read something terrible. Uh, we did uh, actually, I have actually seen a, a social media thing of you being in the away end at Chelsea where you were jumping around with the Villa fans. Well, I'm, I'm an ex-football exec. I go to games and I love it. It's great just being a fan again. I, you know, As I said to you earlier, I was a football fan for 44 years living in total privacy and anonymity and I look back on those years very fondly. There's a song about you, isn't there? You went to Spain in a Lamborghini and you brought back Unai Emery. They sing. Have you heard that one? Yeah, I've heard it. <laughs> now then, we were talking. We were talking just before, um, before about um, the, the European Super League and how, if you'd been at Chelsea, you would have been in quite a difficult position. Talking yes. about you not being able to really walk away from it would have been very hard, even though you opposed it. And presumably at Aston Villa, you were very much on the other side of the fence where you properly opposed it. Yeah. Well, again, it, it kind of happened in between those two. Um, but to be clear. Sean and Henry. Um, I was asked on the morning it was announced and um, I used a very weird word, a John Lennon word. I don't know why it came into my mind because like this I was kind of pinned on a live interview. I said I thought the Super League was grotesque and I said that I didn't think the fans of the two clubs that were really, I think it's generally accepted, the prime movers within the English game in that whole enterprise being Liverpool and United, um, I didn't think the fans of those two incredible clubs would have any truck with the detail of that Super League, the crucial detail that it was a closed league where participation would not be based on merit, in particular in-season merit in the domestic league. I actually felt, as a massive football fan, that no Liverpool fan I'd ever known, or United fan, would want some sort of charity gift into a league when they'd had a bad season. And I uh, said that on the time. You can check the record. I I'm believed sure it. Did, yeah. And it proved to be true. Within 24 hours, the fans of all of those big six clubs made it quite clear that just wasn't what football's all about. And that hasn't changed. Now, that doesn't mean that Mr Abramovich or Mr Henry at Liverpool or any of those big six owners, um, you know, that's detail. But for football fans, it wasn't detail. It was fundamental to what football is all so about. When you when you heard the news about this Super League, yeah. maybe, maybe you had a little bit of a heads up, I don't know. Did you immediately get on the phone and start making calls to all your compatriots outside the Big Six saying, this is outrageous, we've got to stop this now? Well, I didn't really need to. The answer is I spoke to lots of people that Sunday afternoon because we were all absolutely gobsmacked. The implementation was absolutely awful. It looked like someone had sort of cut and pasted a press release together. <laughs> Um, and um, I absolutely thought this is doomed, this can't work, it won't work. Um, and I like, this is a really important point, actually, as we talk about maybe the, you know, what that led to in terms of firstly the fan-led review and ultimately government, government putting in place plans for an independent regulator. Um, you know, when I was interviewed by the fan-led review panel, and I've talked to Tracy about this a lot, Tracy Crouch, actually... The football family, and you are archetypal members of that football family, I see myself that way, football executives, football fans, football coaches, Jurgen Klopp, football players, Jordan Henderson, mainstream uh, participants in the football family, unified in a quite unique way in an incredibly short period of mm. time and torpedoed that, for, in my opinion, for a generation. For a generation, this idea we need a regulator to stop a Super League Yes, there may be variations to the Champions League that come down the pipe in future, but for the chief executive or owner of any of those clubs today to say, you know, we're basically going to leave and join a Super League that's not merit-based and is a direct competitor to the Champions League and is a threat to the Premier League, that's not tenable for any of those clubs anymore. So it was torpedoed, and it was torpedoed quickly, and even government played an active role. I think when the government the next morning said, we're going to drop a legislative time bomb on this concept it was dead before it ever got out of the garage so so i think that was a really a very uplifting moment for 
uh, how football, when it really needs to, can unify itself. And um, so I've never quite bought the argument that blocking the Super League is an ex post rationale for an independent regulator because the family blocked it very effectively. What would happen if 14 of the Premier League clubs were owned by Americans? I don't think it's a question necessarily of American ownership. Um, you know, Manchester City were part of that concept. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't sense... I, I sense the prime movers behind the Super League are not any of the Premier League clubs. Let's be clear about that. Mm-hmm. Cert- and and, and mm-hmm. certainly not clubs of a certain jurisdiction ownership. The prime movers, and we all know this, are those mega clubs in continental Europe whose business models and on-field performance have been systematically weakened by the incredible strength of the Premier League. Everything that comes from Europe in different guises, whether it's changes to the UEFA Champions League format, changes to the coefficient or the Super League, all have one strategic rationale, and that how do we close the ever-widening gap between the size and scale of the Premier League's commercial income and the rest of Europe. The Premier League is now two, three, four times bigger in TV income than Serie A um, and La Liga, let, let alone uh, the Bundesliga and League uh, which are fractions. And so what that means is those mega clubs in Spain, Italy, Germany can see their ability to compete in the global market for coaching talent, and now they're all here, playing talent, and with the retirement of Messi and Ronaldo, I think finally the talent's here too. They can see, taking a 10-year view, if we don't find a way to claw back some of that gap, then in the very long term, English Premier League clubs are going to dominate European competition. And I checked this morning, three English clubs are favourites for the three European tournaments this summer in, mm-hmm. in terms of City to win the Champions League, Liverpool, the Europa League, and Villa to win the Confederation. So... Yeah. That's a strategic issue if you're a continental European club. And I don't judge them harshly, but we need to look at it for what it is. And you may be thinking, so why would the English clubs have any truck with that? Mm. Well, I think they like to ride both sides. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.